Can we have the big screen? Here we go. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you've had a nice break. And we're going to carry on with our parables on two very important subjects, parables on love and parables on wealth. Next slide, please. So um, Pete's going to deal with parables on love. And Willie, as the accountant, is going to deal with parables on wealth. So, uh, OK, Pete, I'm going to hand over to you, please. Thank you. OK, um, there we go. All right. So although this session has the title Parables on Love, I'm only going to talk about one parable. I'm not sure it's actually about love, which is probably the most overused and abused word in the English language these days. However, it's certainly one of the most beloved of all parables, traditionally referred to as the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is set in the direct context of a theological dialogue between Jesus and a lawyer in Luke 10. There have been many attempts to allegorize it over the years, as we've already heard, from Marcion and Irenaeus to Origen through the Middle Ages and Reformation, often with Christ as the Good Samaritan and the Inn as the Church. However, Luke does not call it a parable, and it primarily exists as an exemplum, a short narrative used to point to a moral or sustain an argument. As a great story, we are drawn into it and can't help asking ourselves, what would I do in similar circumstances? Indeed, parables are told by Jesus to challenge the thinking of his listeners. And with the Good Samaritan, that challenge has only grown stronger over the years. So its main difficulty is not understanding it, but applying it in a modern setting. Next slide, please. The dialogue with the lawyer occurs near the start of the Jew in Jerusalem section of Luke's gospel. The dialogue opens with a question from a lawyer seeking to test Jesus. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Later, Jesus will be asked the same question by a ruler, a nobleman in 1818 where he responds with a discussion about the challenges of wealth. There's still one thing lacking, sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor. However, asked by a lawyer, a nomikos, one skilled in the Mosaic law, it's highly likely the question, however phrased, is about the law. Today, we might see this person as a theologian looking to debate a point within his own field of expertise. Perhaps a person more interested in theory than practice, in talking, and in doing. Next slide, please. In Luke's gospel, lawyers are generally seen as like Pharisees, experts in the letter, but not the spirit of the law. Notably, woe to you Pharisees. Woe also to you lawyers. For you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not lift a finger to ease them. That's Luke 11. Jesus' answers, answer to the question about eternal life probes the lawyer's own thinking in a question which we might paraphrase as, how do you yourself read the law on this issue? Next slide, please. The lawyer then gives what is probably the standard response combining Deuteronomy 6.5, part of the Shema, and Leviticus 19.18. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. Now, Rather frustratingly for the lawyer, Jesus simply affirms this is the correct answer to the question about eternal life. Do this and you will live. Next slide, please. Clearly, the lawyer had hoped for more of a theological debate so he could show off his own knowledge. So to get back into the game, he seeks out part of Leviticus 19 that might have been debated by legal experts. And who exactly is my neighbour? Or perhaps who is legally not my neighbour. Lawyer might have then expected Jesus to answer based on the content context of Leviticus 19.18, perhaps to defining who actually qualified as thy people in that passage. Thou shalt not walk deceitfully amongst thy people. Thou shalt not hate thy brother. Thou shalt not be angry with the children of thy people. And thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. However, instead, Jesus responds with a practical example, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Next slide, please. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, gives the setting of the road, 
probably the Roman road, that for 15 miles descended over 3,000 feet through the Judean wilderness, a well-known place of danger to travellers. We know virtually nothing about the victim, although probably a Jew, set upon by robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. It's effectively he's unconscious throughout the whole story. Effectively, incapable of helping himself, it is his need for help that drives the plot of the story to its resolution. Three potential helpers arrive on the scene, not in this case an Englishman, a Welshman, a Scotsman, but a priest, a Levite and a Samaritan, and all follow the same pattern. They see the victim, imply, implicitly evaluating the situation, then they take appropriate actions. Next slide, please. First on the scene, by chance, is a priest who is going down that road and having seen him, he passed by on the other side. Evaluation. Many have speculated that the priest was motivated by fear of ritual uncleanliness through possible contact with a dead body. Although as he's on his way down the road from Jerusalem and therefore was not on his way to serve in the temple, purity issues should not have weighed so heavily with him. Now, the only thing we know for sure is that he's a priest and therefore similarly to the lawyer likely to evaluate the situation by asking himself what the mosaic law obliges him to do next slide please action he decides not to engage at all with the injured man and crosses to the other side of the road the levite is in a similar circumstance to the priest he's a temple official whose life was dominated by the law but perhaps as a more junior official, one might expect him to be less fastidious about exact legality. However, his actions mirror those of the priest. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Next slide, please. After the priest and Levite, Jesus' listeners might have been expecting some sort of Jewish layperson in descending order from priest and Levite. However, the next person is introduced as a wayfaring Samaritan. Some see Samaritans and Jews as locked in a relationship of mutual hatred, and therefore a Samaritan, as the hero of the story, would be a great shock to a Jewish audience. However, for Luke, the Samaritans are also people who follow the law, the first five books of the Old Testament. They are of the circumcision, and as such, unlike Gentiles ritually, Gentiles ritually clean. See Acts 8, 14 and 11, 1 to 3. Next slide, please. So on paper, the Samaritan's evaluation of the situation might have been not have been that different to those of the other two. What does the law say I should do, since he was also bound by the law? Well, they might have been more able to claim that the injured man was not his brother or of his people or perhaps of his tribe. So although there would have been some level of surprise at the choice of a Samaritan, the real shock would have been if Jesus had chosen an unclean Gentile, which would have brought all sorts of other complications into the story. Evaluation. The first thing that the Samaritan does, unlike the priest and Levite, is to come near to the injured man, approaching him, reflecting his openness to become engaged. Jesus then gives his motivation. He was moved with compassion, the verb splanchnidzomai. Now splanchnidzomai is the cognate of the noun splanchnon, basically a person's guts or innards. And it's used here as a metaphor for the seat of emotions. So the Samaritan's first reaction is not to think about the law, but it's a gut instinct. Similarly, the father's reaction on seeing the returning prodigal son was to be filled with compassion also. Again, the, the verb splanch in 1520. Next slide, please. Action. The Samaritan's compassion leads not to one action, but a whole series of consequences. One, he went to him and bandaged his wounds. Two, having poured oil and wine on them. Three, then having put him on his own animal, he brought him to an inn. Four, and took care of him. Five, the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and when I come back, I'll repay you whatever more you spend. Next slide, please. So this is not an attempt to do the legal minimum, but an open-ended commitment to the injured man. 
So I think this is the challenge for us today. We all face when we decide when we want to help somebody. Your first thought might be, where will it lead? How much will it cost us in terms of time, money, and stress, etc.? And often helping people is a very intensive thing. The case, uh, the care the Samaritan offers is not a model of moral obligation, according to Joel Green, but of exaggerated action grounded in compassion that risks much more than could ever be required or expected. Next slide, please. Having completed the parable, Jesus turns to the lawyer and asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer answers, the one who showed him pity or compassion. So perhaps the lawyer does, can't actually bring himself to say the word Samaritan. However, the answer he gives is a good one because it grasps the key point that love for neighbor is not about an emotion. It's not about who we are or what we believe, but it's about what we do in practical terms or showing love is. Finally, Jesus brings the whole dialogue full circle saying, go and do likewise which answers the lawyer's original question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? However, for the lawyer and for us, the challenge of Jesus is the extent of the commitment to do likewise, to act as a Samaritan acted. So according to Bailey and through peasant, uh, peasant eyes, by his answer, Jesus simply says, you want to do something to inherit eternal life? Very well. Just continually love God and your neighbour with the totality of all that you are. There's no line drawn, no list of how much is expected. Rather, the requirements are left limitless. Next slide, please. So implications for us today. First, eternal life. The first challenge for evangelical Christians is that Jesus appears to be preaching salvation by works, as the dialogue between Jesus and the lawyer makes no mention of repentance. However, John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. But when crowds came out to be baptized, he said, bear fruit worthy of, of repentance. Then people asked John, what then must we do? That word again, and received answers like, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. Next slide, please. Even John the Apostle, who wrote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life, also wrote in 1 John 3, How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and denies compassion? Again, the word splenched on to them. Little children, let us love not in theory or speech, but in reality and action. In other words, the claim of those like the lawyer to love God with all their heart, soul, strength and mind is meaningless unless validated in practical love to their neighbours over defined. Next slide. Please. Christian ethics. Even allowing for hyperbole, it would be clearly be a mistake to base our whole system of ethics on one parable rather than taking into account the wider teaching in the New Testament about compassion for those in need. So Jesus also said, the poor you will always have with you. Mark 14, 7, interestingly omitted by Luke. Nevertheless, the parable of the compassionate Samaritan still makes uncomfortable reading today as it did 2000 years ago for those who claim to love God. I'm watching a program on TV. An advertisement comes on and I see pictures of children in Africa disfigured by cleft palates. I temporarily turn over the channel so that I can walk by on the other side. But for me, the guilt remains. Next slide, please. So how do we fit the parable into 21st century Christian ethics? Contemporary Christian ethics has three major strands. Virtue ethics, which stresses character building. Deontology, which stresses duty and obligation. And consequentialism, such as the utilitarianism of Bentham and Mill. In the dialogue with the lawyer, Jesus seems to be endorsing a form of virtue ethics in championing the virtue of compassion over adherence to the letter of the law, 
which spells out obligations, in other words, deontology or duty. Aristotle and his followers like Thomas Aquinas emphasize that the purpose of ethics is to develop virtues which impel proper action, not merely to know what to do by applying the law, which can't fit every circumstance. Next slide, please. However, even if we develop a natural propensity towards the virtue of compassion, how can we, limited by our own resources, meet the open-ended commitments advocated in the parable? According to Fitzmaier, a neighbour is anyone in need with whom one comes into contact and to whom one can show pity, compassion again, and kindness, even beyond the bounds of one's own ethnic or religious group. The challenge in Fitzmaier's definition of a neighbour lies in the caveat with whom one comes into contact. The problem is that through modern media, we are aware of, come into contact with, an immense array of needs, meaning that almost anybody in the world could count as our neighbour. If we are not to burn out our resources overnight in a world of near infinite need, we must prioritise. For example, even if we decide to give up our house to a Ukrainian refugee, what about all the Afghan refugees? Instead of teaching that the reaction to all circumstances should be to meet every need in full, we must also embrace some elements of deontology and consequentialism. The principle of moral proximity, the closer the moral proximity, the greater the moral obligation, introduces an element of deontology or duty as we arguably have a greater degree of duty towards some people than others. So for instance, in 1 Timothy 5.8, Whoever does not provide for relatives and especially for family members has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Next slide, please. Similarly, we cannot ignore the consequences of our actions and must weigh what we do against the cost of our actions to ourselves and others. But which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Luke 14. 28. Conclusions. At the start of this talk, I said I was not sure the parable is about love, whatever that rather abstract concept means. It's certainly about the much more practical emotion or gut instinct of compassion. Remember, as I also said, Jesus told parables to challenge his listeners not to provide simple answers to complex questions. Jesus did not answer the question about who is who is my neighbour, but instead indicated what it means to be a neighbour. If you accept somebody as your neighbour, that implies potential obligations of practical compassion towards them. The challenge for each of us is that we must define who is our neighbour, but be very careful. The word neighbour implies a nearness, a relationship, a connectedness. However, if on reflection you think that you have the obligations of Christian neighbourliness to everyone, everywhere, regardless of their and your circumstances, then please feel free to send me your bank details and passwords, house keys, etc. And I'll make sure they're put to good use. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. I'll be sending you an email shortly then, in that case. Yes, it's, I, I, I think first number of points there. I think it was good you pointed out the Samaritans who are descendants of Abraham were circumcised and to keep the law. So they were not unclean and many people forget about that. I think you're also right about the word love is greatly abused and overused in today's society. But of course, the agape love of the Bible, as you've pointed out, is a love of action. It's a love of doing. It's a love of doing. But it's so easy, like the priest and the Levite, maybe they thought what they had to do was more important, and maybe the priest was going down to Jericho to perform some circumcisions or something, and so didn't want to. And it can, it can actually cause a big problem if you're too bound by your traditions, by your habits, by the law. I remember some years ago, a friend of mine, a relatively new Christian, at nine o'clock at night, always regularly went to her bed room and read her Bible and prayed for an hour. Sadly, her father died and um, she went home to her mother and got in at about 10 to nine 
and uh, instead of staying there to console her mother, took herself off to the bedroom to do her Bible study and her prayers. Uh, and that, that, was not an, that was not wise, but it was a relatively new Christian. But who's our Samaritans? That's a very good question. Is it the whole world? Well, if we think of the people we come in contact with quite a lot are the street people. I live in Reading and we have a number of street people who are begging. And the police have told us, begged us not to give any money to them because some of them are professional beggars and don't need the money. Others do it part time to get extra money. And those who perhaps are more genuine want it for alcohol, cigarettes, tobacco. You should give it more to organizations that help them. So I don't tend, whether I'm right or not, you, I don't really know, but I don't tend to give them anything when I see them. I do, we do support Christians Against Poverty. We do support the Salvation Army. And I, we do support a number of the local charities in Reading which deal with these people. And the support we give is regular so that those organizations know where they stand. And uh, anyway, that brings us on really now to the issue of what do we do with our money? Do the parables on wealth say anything about that, Will? Over to you, boy. Well, they've got a few things to say. Um, so let's have a think about this. Parables about wealth. So we're going to look at what the Lord had to say on that subject. There are three parables we're going to think about over the next while. Um, the parable of the rich fool, so-called. The parable of the shrewd manager. And also the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So thank you very much for giving me these, especially the last two. But <laughs> first of all, then, um, what's the Lord's attitude to wealth? We all know the story of the rich young ruler. It's already been mentioned where Jesus told him that if he wanted to be perfect, he had to give away all his money and follow him. So is that a universal rule or is it only for the rich young man? Um, we also know about Zacchaeus. We've heard about him too. Um, after meeting the Lord, he said he was going to give away 50% of his possessions. And the Lord appeared to approve of that. So the 100% rule isn't right across the board. Also, I think it's doubtful if Jesus or, or Paul, in fact, could have done the work they did without the support of believers who did have quite a lot of resources. So giving everything away is, is not a universal command. Paul and others encourage us to be generous and to give as the Lord has promised, has prospered us. And some people will tithe their income. Well, is that enough? Or is, is that too much? Perhaps at some times in our lives when we've got young children or big mortgages, studying at university, we need to be careful. But maybe later in life, when we've got less commitments, maybe we could afford to give more. It's something we need to think about very carefully. I occasionally hear people say, well, everything I have belongs to the Lord. Well, that's great, but it's usually a bit of a cop out. So if, um, so if, I, if my car belongs to the Lord, how do, what does that mean in real terms? Well, I take a lady to church every Sunday. So that's, that's using it for the Lord's work. I can't expect her to travel not in comfort, so I own a BMW. So the, where does the argument go here? At what point do we say this belongs to the Lord? This is uh, my own. I think as we as we look at these parables, I think the point that comes through is people's attitude to their possessions. Are they the possessions what give us a, as a sense of self-worth? Are they where we put our trust? Do we feel secure because of our investments? Or do we feel secure because we belong to the Lord? And I think the first parable really spells this out. This is the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. The parable is triggered by a question that Jesus has asked by someone in the crowd. It says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. That's an interesting instruction. The man obviously feels he's been the, the victim of some kind of injustice. He doesn't ask Jesus to arbitrate. He just asks Jesus to decide um, and hand it over. And Jesus will have none of this. He says, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between them, between you? 
But Jesus immediately goes on to talk about the danger of money and the danger of greed. He turns to his disciples and he warns them about this. He says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So what do you value most in your life? What makes you, you? Are we dominated by our possessions or, or something else? And then he tells the story of a rich farmer whose estate produces a bumper crop too much for his barns to hold. And he resolves to tear down these barns, build bigger ones, and then sit back and enjoy his wealth for years to come. This is a man that's solely focused on himself. Look at what he says here in Luke 12, 18 to 19. Look at the number of times we get I or me or my or myself. This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But unfortunately, God had other plans. And that very night, Jesus says for emphasis, that very night, his life was demanded from him. I think that's more powerful than saying that very night he died. It's like saying that God is holding to him account and his life is forfeit. And finally, Jesus concludes in verse 21 there. This is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. So there's the choice. Either store up for yourself or be rich towards God. What, what does rich towards God mean anyway? Well, rich where being rich where God is concerned is what how Phillips translates it. Perhaps not really all that much more clear. I think it's what Jesus called in the Nick calls in the next section of Luke, building up treasure in heaven. In other words, he tells his disciples that they are to do this, build up treasure by seeking his kingdom. In other words, by living in ways that cultivate the kind of character that is appropriate for members of his kingdom. Generosity, putting others first. The Good Samaritan, of course, is an illustration of that. That's where our priorities should be. Shortly before lockdown, I was at a funeral service, and as we all filed out of the church at the end of the service. There were two men coming out who were immediately behind me. I didn't know them. They would probably be in their 50s or early 60s. And one of them was telling the other one how much money his company was making. And I felt like turning around and saying, look, we've just buried a guy who's younger than you, who keeled over in his back garden with a heart attack. And you're talking about how much money you're making? So where is our treasure? So that's the parable of the so-called rich fool. What about the parable of the shrewd manager? This second parable, I think, is considered to be one of the weirdest of Jesus' stories. And there are various views on, on what its meaning is. It comes at the start of chapter 16 of Luke, immediately after the stories of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. So unlike the parable of the rich fool, there isn't really a, a context that we have to go on. The basic story is this, the hero or perhaps the anti-hero is a man who's working for a manager. He's, work, he's a manager working for a rich man and he's been accused of wasting his master's possessions and he knows he's going to be sacked. So he goes around all the people who owe his master's master money and agrees to reduce their bills in the hope that if he loses his job, then maybe they'll be well disposed towards him and will perhaps give him a job with them. Though whether you'd want to employ someone like that is another issue. So it's a pretty sordid story. But what's really surprising is Jesus' comment on it. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So, I mean, that's Jesus' apparent moral that he draws from it. You look at it and you think, well, the master commended him. The master is obviously as crooked as the manager was. He recognized the kindred spirit, perhaps. Congratulates him on his astuteness. 
But although he congratulates him, presumably he doesn't say he's pleased with what he's done. But what's the lesson for the disciples and, and for us too? I mean, is Jesus really commending that kind of behavior? Surely not. The commentators on this uh, come up with some amazing ideas, wonderful imagination. Some have suggested that the manager had added interest or usury to the bills, which is illegal against Jewish law. And what he was now doing was correcting these and putting them back to what they should be. There's nothing in the story to indicate that. But I think in fact that Jesus is making three separate distinct points in the story. And I think we'll only get confused if we try to conflate these into one single message. First of all, I think if we're to see Jesus, meaning we need to see the contrast he's making. Look at verse eight there. And in verse eight, he says, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. Now, Jesus is not saying that the disciples needed to get a tighter grip on their finances. He's not saying that they need to be more forward looking in their financial planning. Because after all, he says there in verse 13, you cannot serve God and money. So therefore, the first point really is that the people of this world are more committed to focusing on what's important to them than the Lord's people are on focusing on what's important to them. The people of this world are more likely to prioritize the things that will help them to reach their goals than perhaps Christian people are. For example, the dishonest man manager works out this really complex scheme to make sure that he's going to be secure financially. Well, what lengths are we willing to go to to accumulate treasure in heaven, which is what Jesus was speaking about in chapter 12 in the next chapter? This is the kind of treasure, he says, that never corrupts. No one can steal it. He's already spoken about the lost sheep and the lost coin that the owners will do anything to find. So how much more should the disciples work to build up treasure in heaven? The problem for us is that often I think we have a, a foot in both camps, don't we? And in some aspects of our lives, we have the same priorities as the people who know nothing of the Lord. So I think that's the first thing. We need to focus our priorities. And perhaps some of the people that we see out there in the world who are, are solely focused on maximizing their wealth, maybe they've got, a, they've got a point. But we should be focusing not on wealth, but on treasure in heaven. Second lesson, I think, is this. If you can't be faithful in small, unimportant things, who's going to trust you with large, really important things? I mean, verses 10 to 12 there. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be entrusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? So there you've got a contrast there between worldly wealth, money and so on, and true riches, treasure in heaven, faithfulness. I think is no accident. People who are faithful and honest in small things will be faithful and honest in the big things. See the, the contrast there in the middle verse between worldly wealth and true riches. If we are dishonest like the manager in the story with worldly things, is God really going to reveal his truth to us? I think the third point is very bluntly stated. Jesus picks up what he said earlier. He says, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then he says bluntly, you cannot serve God and money. So where is our treasure then? Are we so earthly minded that we're no heavenly use? If you want to turn around that well-known saying, if we are bogged down in the material things of this life, we lose out when we meet the Lord. This is really difficult, I think, how to be in the world, but not of the world, because we have to pay attention to material things to some extent and manage them wisely. How else can we support our families? How much should we give to the Lord's work? What sort of car should we be driving? But Jesus' parable, I think, obviously hits the mark because Luke says that, in, that the Pharisees who loved money 
sneered at the Lord when they heard this. But Jesus' final remark to the Pharisees really pushes the point home, I think. You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. So first we've got a, a parable about a man who's totally focused on himself and thought he was invincible. God stepped in and required his life from him. He'd not taken into account what was really important. The second parable speaks about those who, like the first man, concentrate on things that the world values highly, but which God regards as detestable. Mm -hmm. So what about this third parable? This third parable focuses on another rich man, and he is also judged for his selfish focus, the rich man and Lazarus. Now, this parable is one of the most difficult in Scripture. And it's also the one that's been made to mean all sorts of things. I've even heard it said that it's not a parable at all. It's a description of actual events of what is actually happening now in the afterlife. Well, I think there's an awful lot of problems if you take that view. I mean, the Jews used to call paradise Abraham's bosom. But here it's literal. Abraham's there talking to the rich man in hell. It's taken literally. Is it feasible that people in heaven will be able to interact with those who are in hell and vice versa? What sort of God would set up a system like that? And why was the rich man in hell and Lazarus in paradise anyway? I mean, Lazarus must have been a follower of Jesus, we are told. Well, we're not told that at all. So there's no mention of what they believe. Lazarus's only merit seems to be that he's poor. So how can we make sense of it? Um, one writer I was reading says it's an adaptation of an old folk tale. The main thing that leaps out from the story is the idea of role reversal. Nothing is said about the religious beliefs of either of them. The rich man doesn't appear to be guilty of some great sin. He's just lived in luxury every day, living for himself, making no attempt to help poor Lazarus, no food, no decent clothes, no medical help for his sores. Who knows if he's even aware that Lazarus is lying outside? We don't really know if he's aware of Lazarus is there at all. So in the afterlife, their roles are reversed. It's the rich man who now is suffering while Lazarus is in paradise. And Jesus says that explicitly. Abraham says, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things and now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Again, we are left with a feeling that where we set our priorities is the main issue. The man had set his, fo his focus on himself and his luxury and he was heedless of the disadvantaged people around him. But there's a sting in the tail at the end of this story. As the rich man pleads with Abraham to send Lazarus back to earth to warn his brothers to not to fall into the same trap, Abraham in the story makes the conclusion, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now, obviously, the Lord was just about to arrive in Jerusalem. He knew what was going to happen to him there, and he also knew that he would be coming back from the dead, but that the people were not going to believe. They were not going to accept it, even if someone did come back from the dead. So what are we going to make of this? What about the Lord's teaching on wealth here? At the beginning, I mentioned the Lord's meeting with the, the rich young ruler, which comes two chapters after the story of the rich man Lazarus. And remember the Lord's conclusion as the young man wandered away very sadly, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God for a rich man. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And we're told the disciples are astonished. Who then can be saved? And the Lord responds by saying that what's impossible with men is possible with God. So then from these stories, why is it difficult? Why is it difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom? Well, there's no doubt that 
It's harder to feel dependent on God if we have a lot of wealth that can make us feel very self-reliant. I was speaking to someone a few days ago who was talking about um, a chat they'd had with a colleague at work who said simply, I don't need God. Why do I need God? I'm fine as I am. Everything's okay. So it can make us self-reliant. It could create feelings of greed or the enjoyment of luxury, and that takes up our time and our energy. Also, it can separate us from the needy, the needy people around us, because we just move in different circles, just like the rich man who probably didn't notice Lazarus at all. And I think what really emerges is this whole issue of priorities. Where is our true treasure? And where do we concentrate our efforts to build up our treasure? The rich farmer in the first story and the rich man in the third story are obsessed with their wealth and their luxury lifestyles. The second story of the dishonest manager tells us that the people of this world are more focused on what's important to them than we perhaps are on what's important to us. And it's tough for us, I think, because we're all faced with this big temptation in the form of wealth in one form or another. If we can't get that kind of wealth in perspective, Jesus says, how can you be entrusted with heavenly treasure? You can't serve both God and money. Something has to give. I mean, personally, I think uh, it's a big issue for us, this. Compared to an awful lot of people, we are wealthy, but we don't really think of it sometimes in these terms. And like the two rich men in Jesus' stories, we're not evil people. We don't go up to beggars in the street and burn 20 pound notes in front of them. We just don't see them. And therefore we don't think about them. It's something that has bothered me greatly recently. I think in our country, prices are, are rising exponentially, largely driven by fuel costs and so on. But people are suffering real hardship. Demand for food banks is, is going up. What responsibilities do we have? Should we think about the people who are near to us? Who is my neighbor? Who realistically can we help? It is something that I think we do have to be very thoughtful about. Thank you, Will. Thank you for that very thought-provoking talk. And I, I tend to agree with a comment you made earlier on about different times of our life, we can do um, different uh, things. I know when I just after I bought my first flat before I was married, the mortgage rate went from 6% to 14.5%. I had to take two extra jobs and um, I didn't have hardly any money to give. But, you know, once the kids left home, all of a sudden I had all this spare money so I could give more. It'd be quite incredible, really. The other thing is that what you say about the people of this world are more committed than the people of light. And I think I saw that this morning. My daughter and her husband, they have three boys who all play Saturday morning football. She won't do Sunday morning football because they go to church. And I'm amazed at the commitment of the people there to teaching their children football. The amount of time they give up, they give up Saturday mornings and an evening in the week and everything like this. And I find really that uh, I question where are they these football fanatics are more committed than some Christians. So there we go. So parables of a materialistic society. I don't really want to be wealthy. I like Mr. McCorber, who, if I, in the Dickens character, if I put it in modern terms, who said, if it costs me £100 a week to live and I earn 95, I'm of all men most miserable. If it costs me £100 a week, uh, to live and I earn £105 a week, I am of all men most happy. And I think that's what I like. I like a little bit of extra. Uh, I don't really want a lot of extra because I'm not confident in myself that I would use it wisely. But anyway, um, one of the things that Paul talks about in 1 Timothy 6, uh, where he talks uh, to Timothy and gives him advice about the way wealthy people should... Um, you know, look after others. And he then says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And I think 
And Paul learned that at the end of Philippians. He says, I've learned whether I'm well fed or whether I'm not, whether I'm in need or I've got plenty, I have learned in whatever situation to be content. And I think that's that's a lesson we all have to learn. And um, yeah, we also have to learn this lesson well of how much do we give? Anyway, let's finish there now. Let's take another break. Uh, this time I'm going to have a coffee to back me up because after the next session, we are going to have a, a time when you can all um, make comments and ask questions of the speakers. So I'll see you all in about uh, 10, 15 minutes time. Thank you. Bye.